whereas a certain strand of evolutionary psychology looks at male-female relations mostly in terms of our reproductive instinct, terror management theory looks at the influence of the survival instinct. More concretely, at the conflict between our survival instinct and the knowledge of our mortality. At the anxiety it generates, and how we seek to suppress it. In other words, how our death-denying culture acts upon even the most primal drives like sex and food. In terms of male-female relations, this is not just some standard fear of dying alone or uh, being more vulnerable without a partner, or even a culturally sanctioned procedure like marriage. No, this is a fundamental priority reaching every aspect of interaction. From this perspective, what men and women want from each other is largely the same thing they want from culture. Ego and pleasure to escape death anxiety. Ego to counter the insignificant status of death with the significant status of culture, which represents life. And pleasure to forget fear through immersion in the senses. A man may feed his ego by simply being someone in the eyes of the other, or by living up to the relationship standards of society, like getting married, having a girlfriend, and so on, or its byproducts, like having a genetic legacy, children that carry his name, his ideas, etc., or by romantically elevating the woman above her animal nature, she's an angel, and so on, which then rubs off on him, elevating him as well. Of course, the lack of choices some males have may further incentivize this romantic elevation. Naturally, males and females often want to feel they have been chosen for their unique special characteristics. They don't want to be merely judged according to some standardized cultural or evolutionary measure of mate value, which would make them feel easily replaceable, rob them of their individuality, and put them in a category of animal sameness instead of symbolic human uniqueness. The balance between collective and individual symbolic value is always a delicate balance. Now, another one of several ego strategies for males is what is sometimes called phallic narcissism. Allocating the locus of their ego to their penis and sexual conquests above and beyond the mere sensual pleasure of the sexual act. This strategy shares some things in common with female nymphomania, in that it to some extent embraces what some therapists call a counterphobic attitude, that is, submerging oneself in the animal body and its pleasures, in an effort to overcome the fear associated with it. Or sadomasochism, where one narrowly focuses on the animal body to enact a symbolic game of power and submission as a controlled substitute for larger and scarier sources of power and submission in the universe. Or other forms of perversion, where individuals want to feel special and escape animal sameness by expressing some unusual sexuality. In general, the transcendence of our anxious animal mortality takes a somewhat different form with women than with men. 
she may feel attracted to a man who radiates confidence through his symbolic identity, especially if it affords a solid character armor with which he can successfully face the social world, adding smoothness and charm to his courtship and interactions, calibrating to the subtle meanings, patterns, and rhythms that, in Ernest Becker's words, sustain social life by a flimsy and precarious thread. This identity or social armor is most easily obtained through cultural status, which also tends to yield anxiety-buffering financial and social benefits to the woman. Of course, a woman must exchange her own attractive qualities, especially physical ones, for a maximum quantity of attractive qualities in the opposite sex. She can't aim too high without ending up single. Plus, she is often limited in her choices by cultural and psychological constraints. So after weighing her choices, a compromise takes place. And both males and females may experience substantial anxiety and solitude, making a less-than-ideal partner preferable to being alone. But if we look at the zenith of female desire, we know that hedonistic men, when coupled with status, become particularly attractive and fascinating to most women. Because now, his death-denying symbolic identity synergistically joins a pleasurable death-forgetting immersion in the senses. It's the man who gives her the butterflies, who stimulates her emotions and nerve endings while she is enveloped in the safe, death-denying influence of his symbolic identity. The man who allows her to indulge in her animal sexuality without guilt or anxiety. And ideally, the man who elevates her ego by association. The archetype of this type of individual in our modern era is, of course, the rock star, the quintessential extreme example of the man who merges status and hedonic celebration. Hence the expression, getting laid like a rock star. Furthermore, the status of a rock star borders on the religious, in the sense that In our mostly secular world, music and rock concerts are the closest thing for most people to a religious ritual or celebration. Art in our secular world is mostly a dreamlike interpretation of reality. It doesn't literally imply that you have an immortal soul, but it can imply symbolic possibilities beyond the material world of death and decay. And performing arts, like concerts, are perhaps the most immersive of all. To better understand this, we should distinguish between two major types of personal significance or status throughout history. One, earthly or secular significance, and two, cosmic or religious significance. One offers importance and legacy on earth, normally with a narrower locus of self-esteem acquisition. The other offers importance and immortality on a larger cosmic scale. The latter can be a particularly powerful way to gain sexual access to women, as we've seen from a number of religious and uh, cult leaders in the past. One could hypothesize that the evenly distributed sense of cosmic significance or status we see in some primitive tribes, for example, the Kalahari Bushmen, 
may explain the more egalitarian sexual access women grant to man, despite a normal bell curve distribution of other attractive physical and psychological male attributes. In other words, death anxiety became an extremely important addition to the adaptive features that made hominid males attractive before we became homo sapiens. Sometimes overlapping these older adaptive features, sometimes suppressing them, sometimes enhancing them. We do see among all our great ape cousins qualities like dominance, temperament, size, and other physical features granting sexual attractiveness to the male. But once we came to require a cultural transcendence of our animal nature and mortality, mate selection changed drastically. Our personalities and temperaments became greatly influenced by the need to escape death anxiety, by the need to experience cultural significance and or hedonic escapism. For example, a tall, strong, handsome, well-endowed, temperamentally dominant and likable individual in a pre-homo sapiens tribe would undoubtedly have great reproductive success. However, a homo sapiens with similar natural tendencies could be completely ruined psychologically if brought up in a dysfunctional cultural environment, rendering him extremely shy, anxious, and mentally ill from his absence of death anxiety buffers. This would render him sexually unattractive. And conversely, a short, physically unattractive, temperamentally more anxious and unpleasant individual with less reproductive success in a pre-homo sapiens society might today achieve great success with women if his personality and status flourish under the right cultural influences and anxiety buffers. Generally speaking, our ego structure is substantially mediated by invented, largely arbitrary cultural activities and beliefs, that is, abstract meaning systems, that have virtually nothing to do with the specific adaptive threats or tendencies we encountered, or that could even be postulated logically, in the course of evolution before we became Homo sapiens. Work on primates shows that coalitions and alliances in primate groups serve very specific adaptive goals. In humans, the achievement of those previous adaptive goals became threatened by the paralyzing anxiety of death. Thus, humans had to invent symbolic culture, that is, activities and beliefs, to escape that paralyzing anxiety and get on with the business of life. As I said at the beginning, these activities and beliefs have mostly to do with ego and pleasure. Ego to counter the insignificant status of death with the significant status of culture, and pleasure to forget fear through immersion in the senses.